Welcome to our Math and Science show. I am Science Mom, this is Math Dad, and today is Earth Day. Happy Earth Day to those who are watching live, and if you are watching the replay afterwards, happy Earth Day to you too, belatedly. Happy Earth Day to the Earth. That's right. Today we are talking about ecology. This week has had a theme of geology, but because it's Earth Day, we thought it would be fun to talk about ecosystems and share some stories of some really unusual invasive species. But before we, we do that, I want to just say hello really quick to all the people who I'm seeing in the chat. Hello to Owen, Queen Jane, Adrian, Eula, Roberta, Deb, Lucas, Charmy, Yulia, Leela. And I've seen people saying where they're watching from. We have people from California, Nebraska, South Carolina, Texas, from all over the United States and Canada. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I do want to say something about how long quarantine is running. This educational math and science show that we have, how long is it going to last? When are we going to, we've said we're going to the end of the school year, but the school year ends at different times for different people. I did a survey on Patreon and we have people who are, their school year ends May 15th and people who don't end until the middle of July. July. So, June or July? July in the, in, the, in, the, in the United Kingdom. We have a viewer, a patron who said that they, they go until mid July. So there's a lot of variability. Here's what we are doing. So today is the 22nd of April. We are going to run for the next six weeks. So this is week six of quarantine. We're going to go till the very end of May. This will be our last full day of quarantine. And then the first week of June, we're gonna sort of have like a special fun week where we transition to our summer content. And what will be happening in summer, you may be wondering. Well, every Friday, we're gonna to continue to have a chat with a scientist, have an interview with a scientist. And this Friday, we're super excited to have Sam come on, who is a volcanologist who studies volcanoes. And he's gone in submersibles under the ocean to study underwater volcanoes. He's done a lot of really cool research and he's gonna share some photos and videos of his research and tell us how he got to be a scientist who studies volcanoes. We're gonna continue that all through the summer and we'll have more, more updates about summer content coming soon. I am super excited for that. One last like extra special thing before we get started. I have a map for you and I want you to take a guess as to what this map means. So you can see Manitoba and Quebec are colored in Canada. And then we have this interesting pattern of states that are colored. Any guesses in the chat? What does this map represent? I'm seeing a couple a couple guesses that you know maybe it has something to do with where people are watching from today. That's actually not quite what it is, but it's close. It has to do with something that we're quite excited about. We have a enamel pin and sticker club on Patreon. And so this yesterday we sent out little letters showing previews of the stamps that are coming out in the Stick, stamps, the pins. The pins, the enamel pins that are coming out over the next five months and a little pack of four stickers that have little science jokes. We sent those yesterday to everyone who had joined the enamel pin and sticker club. And as you can see from this example here, I have a whole bunch of envelopes that already are stamped and just need your address. So if you'd like to join our enamel pin and sticker club, you can, and we'll, we'll fill out our map as, as we collect addresses. That was on Patreon, right? Yes, that's on Patreon. All right. Um, Yesterday. So, and I'm, I'm seeing now so many interesting creative guesses about like where, where pollution is less after COVID-19, you know, very <laughs> scientific guesses. Sorry, fake for, out there. For Earth Day, that would have been a, <laughs> a very appropriate topic. It would, it would. Yeah, it really is interesting to, to see the environmental impacts of people not driving their cars. The skies are clearer and cleaner than we have ever seen them. Yeah, it is, it is. But I've, I just wanted to begin with that, sharing that map, because it was really fun as we were addressing, you know, printing out our labels and putting them on envelopes yesterday to see just the, the wide range of locations. Shout out, special shout out to California, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, because we have the, the most um, enamel pin and sticker club patrons in those states. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who has supported us on Patreon, because we would not be able to do this without you. And thank you to our regular viewers, too, especially those of you who are active in the, in the chat. Um, it, you guys make this show what it is, and we're so happy to have your support. That's right. We were up early this morning saying, let's get some upvotes <laughs> long before the video even started. Yep. All right. So yes, yesterday we collected some data 
and during the show and then we tried to display it. And I want to collect some more data today for our math lesson. So I'm going to paste a link into the description here. In, into the chat. Into the chat, yep. Which is different than the description. Oh man, did it go? Didn't go. I can do this. Copy and paste. All right. It works. It works. And so yeah, you, you can go in, in Give yourself a nickname, fill out the form. I've actually got three different questions. We're gonna do that same challenge again. I want you guys to pick the smallest positive whole number that nobody else chooses. Between zero, between one yeah. and 20. No, no, uh, well, I've got one between and zero and 200 for that one. And then I've got a couple other questions that involve picking a number between zero and 20, because today we wanna to talk about what does it mean to find the center of a group of numbers and so that, that's what our math lesson is on and if you guys will actually give me some numbers to work with I think it'll make the questions a lot more interesting so all right awesome but first before we do math we are going to share our art and engineering prompts and then we are going to have a science lesson and then our factor fiction and then the math lesson so let me pull those up real quick so you guys can see what our engineering prompt is for today and what our math prompt is Yesterday, we did hexaflexagons and forced perspective photos. And if you have not seen the gallery on Facebook, you should definitely go and check it out because the submissions we got are just amazing. Several of them <coughs> involve people who are shrunk down, like this person who is running from the lawnmower <laughs> and about to get eaten by the lawnmower. And there was such creativity with the submissions. It was really fun to see. And we'll have a slideshow of those at the end. That's right. But we don't, we're only trying to include the ones where you can't really identify the person. You can't really person. see faces. So, but the Facebook has a lot more that are interesting. But you can see the faces. So we didn't include them in our later slideshow. And then for today, our, engineer, our art prompt is to create a miniature art gallery. So would use whatever materials you want, create a really tiny art gallery that could fit like on a floorboard and then take a picture of it and you can even set up some little toys like some little Lego figurines who are going through your art gallery and enjoying the art. That's our art prompt. And our engineering challenge is to create a Newton's cradle. And Math Dad and I made one out of water balloons yesterday that we'll show you later <laughs> on that had kind of interesting results. Sure. All right, now let's talk about ecology. Our word of the day is ecosystem. And an ecosystem is more than just the animals or the environment, it's a combination of both. So as, as a little starting point, Math Dad, if I have a jar of sand right here, is this an ecosystem? Um, so an ecosystem just has to be a place where things can live, right? So I would say yes. It's a fairly boring ecosystem. So if you have a jar of sand and if this is your whole environment, this is your whole world, what would we have in here? We would have the sand, which is mostly silica, and there might be some little bacteria, and there might even be some tiny microinvertebrates. You know, we might have like a tiny little um, insect in here kind of burrowing around. But without a source of food, without organic matter, and without some algae or some other things to, to give, you know, to produce oxygen, this is going to be an ecosystem that's going to die off and not have any living things pretty soon. If we closed it off, and there were no plants in here, then any little animals would use up the oxygen and then you wouldn't have any more life. You would just have sand. So to have an ecosystem that is self-sustaining, where you can continue to have new life, you need to have a couple pieces. And one of those important pieces is to have producers. You need to have the plants that are producing oxygen and that are producing the carbon that the other animals and the other organisms are gonna use. And then the consumers are going to use that carbon and they tend to give back to the producers because they make carbon dioxide and you get this cycle. Wait, but, wait so, so I, I know that people are, animals need plants, but you're saying plants also need the animals? Or? It all depends on how many plants there are um, and, and, and how they're built. You could have an ecosystem that only has producers and in theory, that might work as long as you had different types of producers so that you could still get that cycle. Because in an ecosystem, you have to have nutrients cycling if it's going to continue going. Because if you have plants taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and there's nothing else putting carbon dioxide back in, you don't have some specialized you know, type of bacteria cell that's going to do the reverse, then eventually they would take all the CO2 out of the atmosphere 
and then they wouldn't have anything to eat, essentially, and they would be done. Hmm. And on Monday, we painted a scene of a carboniferous forest, and we talked about how the early trees, those lycopod trees, they changed the climate of the whole entire planet because they were drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and making the trunks and the fungi, the fungus and the um, mushrooms, the other decomposers that were on Earth at the time, they hadn't figured out how to digest that material. And so it wasn't being broken down. Right now, things are really well balanced. But during the Carboniferous, this arrow was way stronger than this arrow. And that resulted in a huge change with how much carbon was in the atmosphere. And that caused the first ice age and the first seasons, which led to a mass extinction of all the lycopod trees, unfortunately for them, but good for us and other animals that came along afterwards because it kind of set things up to be a little more friendly for us. All right, I did see a couple interesting um, questions about the meteor shower. We did not go out to the meteor shower yesterday because during quarantine, some days are good days and other days are like, Ugh, you just feel flattened. And yesterday was a, we felt flattened day and we, did, we wanted to go to bed early. But if you saw meteor showers, I would love to hear about it. So definitely, definitely say so in the chat if you saw some meteors yesterday. And if you didn't, and you didn't have a chance to go out, the Lyrid meteor shower should be pretty good tonight as well. The peak lasts over a couple days. All right, back to ecosystems. Let's talk a little bit about geological time. This is something that we ran out of time to talk about yesterday but it has to do with ecology and it has to do with fossils. So this is a trilobite fossil and you can see that the fossil of the trilobite is right inside here. And this often happens with fossils where this was replaced with minerals. This used to be a trilobite, but then minerals moved in and replaced the living tissue with the, a different type of mineral than the surrounding rock. And because of that, you can often have fracture, um, fractures right along where the fossil is, and you get these beautiful impressions just like this one. A lot of what we know about geological time comes from fossils. It's a, like an incredible puzzle that millions, it's happened over millions of years and that thousands of scientists have been working on trying to piece it together. Because when you have rocks formed, the younger rocks tend to be on top the older rocks tend to be down lower. And then when you are looking at fossils, you'll find that certain rocks have certain types of fossils, but not other types. And you can put those pieces together to figure out estimates for how old the earth is and when certain things happened. So math it, I want you to come over to this side. We're gonna see how much you know about geological time. All right. So if we took the beginning of earth, you know, when earth first cooled down and solidified and you had a solid planet, if you start then and you go till now, a period of about four billion years, and we took that and then mapped it to one year. So the Earth forming from a nebula happens on January 1st, and then right now is New Year's Eve. Okay, one, I've got it, one year. Where would you expect we would first see life? Like the very first evidence of, of algae and some photosynthesis going on. When would that happen? Oh man, so, so, so the Earth was cooled on January 1st? Okay, um, I, I think it probably didn't take too long. I, I'm, I'm thinking end of January. Nope, no. end of March, end of March. Ooh. So March 21st, that's when we have the first fossils of algae. We got to have these things called stromatolites, um, strombolites, I mean, and they're, they were these little flats in the ocean, shallow ocean water, where you had this algae growing, and then as the algae grew and died, it would make these layers. And we actually still have some of these that are alive today down off of the coast of Australia. So there are these little kind of colonies of algae. So March, 20, March 21st, we got our first algae. How about first multi-celled organisms? So we have single-celled organisms. When are we gonna get more than one cell? Okay, so the, that's a pretty complicated <coughs> jump because then the cells have to work together mm -hmm. and that's not likely to happen very uh, by, by accident very easily. So I'm going to guess we went all the way to August. September 3rd, pretty oh. good guess. We get our first multi-celled organisms. We get our first jellyfish in November, November 8th. The first dinosaurs come on December 13th. 
Whoa. The dinosaurs go extinct on December 26th, day after Christmas. And then the first mammals come December 14th. But these aren't mammals like you and me. These are, you know, while the dinosaurs were ruling the planet, there were these tiny little, like, kind of like little baby mice mammals. And then the first flowering plants, plants are on December 22nd. The first humans, December 31st at 11.48 p.m. <laughs> Just 10 minutes before midnight. So if you put the, the, all of Earth's history into a year, we've only been here for about 10 minutes. Go, go, go back to the plant month. First flowering plants? Yeah, okay. So the first ferns were, were earlier. You had the first ferns at the beginning of December. But flowering plants that make flowers, those came later. So we had millions of years where you had plants that would produce spores and would produce like these cone things. But flowers were were later. I had no idea flowers were a new thing. I just yeah. assumed they'd been around as long as plants were around. No. Whoa. No. So that is kind of a snapshot view of the geologic history of the Earth. And the fascinating thing about this geologic history is that you have way huge differences in ecosystems depending on where you are in the history. During the Carboniferous, which we did with Painting with a Scientist on Monday, the Earth had a very rich atmosphere that had 35% oxygen. That's so much more oxygen than we have now. Now we have about 21% oxygen. And because of that, you had enormous insects. And they grew to sizes that they can't grow to today because we don't have as much, as much oxygen. And every, at every point on Earth's history, small little changes will cause big effects. And you can duplicate some of this if you try to make your own ecosystem in a jar. So here, I have a jar, and you might recognize this little guy. This is one of our eggshell chia pets. This one was planted with wheatgrass. And I have a little ecosystem here where what I am specifically looking to monitor is some roly-poly bugs. And let me know in the chat what you call these bugs. I'll show you a picture of what they look like because they have a lot of different names. Some people call them roly-poly bugs. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Some people call them sow bugs. Yep. Some oh, people call potato them bugs? potato bugs. Let me know in the chat. What do you call these? I'm seeing a lot of roly polies. I'm seeing some potato bugs. I'm seeing some more roly polies. So it looks like roly poly is probably, and potato bugs are probably the most common names, but sow bugs is another name for them. Cheese logs is a name for them. They've got a lot of really strange pill bugs. I'm saying pill bugs, folly poly, armadillo bugs. I'm seeing a lot of variety of names. They have a lot of different names and they are a really cool invertebrate. One cool fact about them, their, their blood is not red, it's blue, just like an octopus because they use hemocyanin instead of hemoglobin and that's a copper containing compound and because of the copper, it has a blue color. Wait, so you, are you saying there are some roly polies in here or are you you're getting are. ready for them? <clears throat> Why don't I see them? Because they've sort of like burrowed down. There are, there were just a couple, but we're going to gather a couple more to put in here. We have some carrot peelings here for them to eat because they like carrots. And we're adding a little water so our soil is nice and moist. And then we're going to close it for a couple days and observe our roly poly bugs. Now, we don't want to keep it closed indefinitely because I don't think that our grass here is making enough oxygen to to balance the the fungi that we have in here and our roly poly bugs and i definitely don't want them to run out of oxygen so every couple of days we're going to open this up and make sure that it gets some fresh air so this isn't a closed ecosystem but what we're going to be observing is how do the carrot pills break down and are we going to see any other things in our soil here that we got from our garden are we going to find a worm are we going to see other invertebrates and if you make a little ecosystem in a jar and then just spend some time carefully observing it, it's really interesting to see the types of balances that you'll observe. And you'll find that if you add more water or less water, that changes things a lot. You can also change it by making it closed or open, you know, whether you have a lid on or not. And then the amount of light it gets, the amount of sunshine it gets. Our roly polies tend to like places that are dark. So they're usually gonna be burrowing down, but um, they also want this food and so we've got some food here for them with the carrot pill that they should come out and be attracted to. And I'm seeing several several more names for the roly poly bugs. It's really fun how many different names they have. They've got a ton of different names. Now, the reason why we care about ecosystems, 
one of the reasons is because if you understand how all the pieces fit together, then you can better appreciate what's going on and you can prevent disasters from happening if you understand which parts of the ecosystem are important and have an effect. And to understand that better, we're gonna talk about three examples of invasive species. Because if you have a species that invades and takes over, that can cause big changes in an ecosystem and that happened in a continent called Australia. So I'm gonna pull up a picture here to show you because it's hard to appreciate without a photo. You guys have probably seen prickly pear cactuses before. They're a cactus that has sort of a, a pad shaped um, pad shaped leaf or kind of looks like a, like a leaf, but their their stems are these big pads and then they some of them have spines, some of them don't. And the prickly pear cactus was brought to Australia in the early part of the 1900s and they planted it to produce cochineal, which is this tiny little red insect that is used then to make red dye for food additives and all sorts of other things. And when they did that in Australia, it took over. This is a picture from, um, from Wikipedia, a common domain picture that shows you the height of the prickly pear that was growing in Australia. Normally, they do not grow that tall, but they were growing so fast and taking over so much land that you literally had whole entire farms and ranches that became nothing but prickly pear. And this forest, you can see the person there. I mean, that per the prickly pear plant is like th four times taller, three times taller yeah. than the man who is standing there. And it became such a problem that the government just became desperate to try and get rid of the prickly pear because at the rate it was going, it was literally going to take over a decent portion of the country would be nothing but prickly pear. It was growing incredibly fast. So and was, was that the one where I heard they were taking it like flamethrowers and they tried burning it down. They tried poisoning it. And no matter what they did, and they had millions of acres, millions of acres that were taken over in, in prickly pear. Queen Cookie says Australia is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Australia is an incredible country. And it's also very unique because it was isolated for so long. Australia has a very different ecosystem than other plant than other continents. And this prickly pear, which grew quite well in South America, but didn't take over, when you put it in Australia, it did take over. And that's because certain other animals that would normally keep it in check weren't around. They, um, the government decided to bring in a moth called the Cactoblastis moth. And if you want to read a little bit more about this, a couple years ago, I did make a little pocket-sized book about the bug that saved Australia because this little moth really did. And it did it by laying eggs inside the prickly pear. I've got a little, little picture here. Yep. So there's our little larva and there's the little moth. And those little larva, just like the hungry caterpillars can eat a lot, that little larva can eat a lot too. And when the eggs are laid inside the prickly pear, the larva eats the inside of the leaf. And within just a couple years, of them bringing the Cactoblastis moth to Australia, the prickly pear problem was solved. And now if you want to grow prickly pear in Australia, you can grow them, but they're not going to go out of control. And you may have a couple plants that get sick by getting too many of the Cactoblastis moth in them, and then you'll have to prune them back. So that was an example of an environmental control, a biological control that worked. And it worked really well. well. That's lucky that it did work. It is lucky that it did work. But the next time that they tried biological control in Australia, it did not work. They had sugarcane plantations. And Allison says, a moth saved a continent. It totally did. <laughs> it really did. In Australia, they had sugarcane plantations. And there were issues with some pests in the sugarcane plantations. And so they brought in the cane toad, thinking, aha, the cane toad will eat the pests. But it turned out that the toad did not eat the pests and the toad went wild. And the cane toad is still a huge problem in Australia. These toads are big. Look at, look at that toad next to that foot to get an idea of the size of the toad and they're poisonous. So if a crocodile eats the toad, the crocodile dies. Nothing can eat the toad. And because there's not that check and balance, remember how in our consumer producer cycle you had, you had a cycle? Any time in an ecosystem that you have one animal that is acting a certain way, you know, eating a resource or doing something, you want to have a balance 
where it will have a predator or it will have something else that will put it in balance. And since the cane toad did not have that, the cane toad is still a huge problem in Australia where it's taking over ecosystems and they're working hard to try to eradicate it. And then the last invasive species that we'll talk about is one that if you live in the Southern United States, you have probably seen before. This is kudzu vine. It's a green vine that, um, that will cover large areas. And if you look at it in the wintertime, it looks just sort of brown and you can see it draped over trees and other things. Now, interesting fact about the kudzu vine, it's often used in, as an example of an invasive species that has just gone wild. And it's true that it can grow very quickly, especially in the South. But there are a lot of other vines that can grow very quickly in the South too. And kudzu vine would not have become such a big thing if we hadn't done a very good job planting it. Because during the Dust Bowl, during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, there was a real concern about erosion and you know, things were drier and you know there was so much dust and soil that we were losing because of that. The, the, the Conservation Corps in the United States government actually launched this really intensive campaign saying everybody should plant kudzu vine. And they sent out seedlings and seeds everywhere and even offered these incentives to say, you know, if you plant this, it, you know, it will be good to reduce soil erosion and we'll be very glad that you planted it. And it wasn't until we had done all that work planting it and then realized, whoa, this actually grows really, really well, that then we labeled it a weed and now we've been trying to get rid of it in the South and control it ever since. Yeah, that's that's kind of crazy. This <laughs> re reminds me of the, you got the song of the, the old lady who swallows a fly, so she swallows a spider to get the fly. And then, uh-oh, now there's a spider down her throat, so she <laughs> swallows something else and they get this big chain and they just keep making the problem worse. And you know, sometimes you just have to know when to quit and realize you've lost that's true it's true and with with weeds invasive species in weeds it really is an issue of balance so some plants are better at being weeds than others and a really interesting question is why are some things weeds and some things not and you might have heard that old proverb that says um whether or not it's a weed is just a matter of opinion like one person's weed is another person's flower and in some sense that is true but even with that being said some plants are classified as weeds because they do such a good job of establishing themselves and they're really hard to get rid of afterwards. And there are three things that weeds can do that sort of make them superpower plants. One is to be really good at competing with other plants. So, you know, when a plant is next to another one, they're both competing for sunshine and for flowers. And if they're competing with each other, then you're then that's going to that's going to be a problem. Weeds tend to be better at crowding out other plants. Another thing that they tend to do is they have seeds that stagger when they germinate. So some seeds will germinate right away and then other seeds will be like I'm going to lay here in the soil for 3, 5, 10 years and I'm not going to germinate till later. So that is a quick little overview of ecology and our three ecosystems. And now it is time for fact or fiction. All right. Oh, wait, I, I, I wrote these. Math Dad wrote the fact or fiction All right. today. All right, science mom. Fact or fiction? About 59% of the moon's surface is visible from the Earth at one time or another. 59%? 59%. 59%. Um, shouldn't it be 50%-ish? Because the moon is, well, no, I guess because it's, it's a spherical object. So we're not going to, if we're looking straight at it, we're not going to be seeing half of its. 59% seems too high. I'd say it was less than 50% because we're just seeing like the front part of the circle. Mm, okay. So I'm going to say false. All right. Chat hasn't caught up. Oh no. Show. Several of the people in the chat. Ah. The, the, this one is, is true. So the, the moon is tidally locked to the earth, but the, the, there's some wobble. It's not a perfect lock. And so what, what, what do I mean when I say it's, it's tidally locked? So as the moon goes around the earth, if you're the earth, uh -huh. and I'm the moon, I'm... So like you're I'm always facing, facing you the entire time. It's just one individual face that, that's pointing towards you. Yeah, so about 59% of the moon gets is visible at one point or another. At, at any given point in time, we can see about 50%. We're far enough away that we really can see it all. There's the, the, the curvature, it doesn't matter that much at this distance. Although at certain parts of the moon, so if, if you're at the edges of the visible part of the moon, we would look like we are off on the horizon. No, we're not high in the sky, but low in the sky if you were standing on the face of the moon. Interesting. Yeah. And 
but if, if so if you go to those very extremes um yeah you're actually going to be able to see uh an earth rise and an earth set just like we see a sunset sunrise sunset that's because the earth would always be right on the horizon and wobble up and down it i don't even know the time frame for this but over time that extra nine percent actually does experience both light and dark light and dark that's pretty cool yeah. All right. All right, next one. Fact or fiction. During its life cycle, a hurricane can expend as much energy as 10,000 nuclear bombs. What? All right, so how are we quantifying energy here? So, like kilojoules? Um, yeah. yeah. During its life cycle, a hurricane has as much energy as 10 nuclear bombs. Yeah. So the hurricane, I mean, the, the wind speed is really pretty incredible. Yeah, so you have wind speed, and um, you also have... I'm seeing people say true in the chat. I'm going to go with the chat and say true. It, it, it is true. Yes. So, yeah, when I was looking this up, I, I saw that yeah, the, the wind speed alone uh, throughout the, the course of the, the entire hurricane, and this is just an average hurricane. Some, some are more, some are less, but it would expend about half of the energy use for the entire planet for a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's really high. But that's not even the big part. the The whole water cycle. So it's how much water evaporate. Yeah, and it, it takes energy to convert water from yeah liquid gas to gas. To and, liquid. Yeah, yeah the, all all of the that fluctuation, and that's hundreds of times the energy that we use. The entire Earth uses in one day. That is pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So good job there. All right. Thanks, Mom. Fact or fiction? A day on the moon lasts 29 and a half Earth days. I'd say that's probably true because we have like the lunar calendar. It takes close to a month, but not quite for the for us to go through the cycles of the moon. And when we go from like new moon to full moon to back to new moon, I yeah, that would correspond with when the moon is actually experiencing days. That that is absolutely correct. Oh. Because of the Did I get all three of them right? I think you missed the first one. Did I miss the first yeah, one? Whoops. Yeah, so, so you've got the moon going around the Earth, but it, it's it's tidally locked. So you, a, a day, we're thinking, okay, how long does it take for the sun to end up in, I think of the sun going around the Earth. Of course, that, that, that's not the way it happens. But how long does it take for the sun to get back to the same relative position on the planet? That, that's what we would usually call a day. Well, because the, so if, if you're, you're the Earth here, and so I'm, Tidally locked. I'm going around. Your back is facing the sun. If our viewers are That's the right. sun, so yeah. I pretty much had to go all the way around you to, to get back in the same position. However, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so, so that that's that's what we typically call a day. Um, but there's this notion of a side wheel day, and what that means is, so rather than orienting ourselves with relation to the sun. How long does it take us to get back to the same orientation with respect to where the stars were? Because the Earth Ooh. is moving as well, and it's in a different position. And so in particular, as, as the Earth moves, it's... Hey, it's let's, let's try and do this, okay? I'm going to be the Earth, you be the moon. Okay, so going around you, yep. but, but then... And then I'm going to move. Okay, but you're also rotating around some central <laughs> sun. So you're, you're going to change your angle slightly as we go, but All just, right. just slightly because... One twelfth of the way, so I'm going around you. Look, and now I have to go extra far to get back around her. Yeah. So that's kind of it, it turns that. out, yeah, the side reel day for the moon is just about 27 days, but it takes an extra two days to catch up with, because the Earth is now facing a different direction, having gone even further. That's and, sort of cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. So on, we actually have the same thing though. I mean, how long is a day? We say it's 24 hours. But a side reel day, so you've got 23 hours and 56 minutes. It's about four minutes shorter. And that's because, so that the Earth has to go a little extra far to compensate for the fact that it's no longer in the same place in orbit as it's, it's headed around hmm. the sun. That is pretty cool. Yeah. That is pretty awesome. Thanks, Math Dad. Yeah, you're welcome. I thought you'd like that. Real, real quick note before we go on to the math lesson. So ecology demonstrations are a little more difficult to do than um, other demonstrations just because they take more time to set up. But I did want to show you guys real fast, and Mazda, if you can grab me two cups of water real quick. So I, I got a, a cutoff water bottle, and one of them just has dirt, and one of them has dirt and plants. 
And if you want to set up your own, it takes a little while for the plants to grow, but this is a really cool demonstration to do. And we're going to see now when we pour water into these, we're going to see which one has the most soil runoff. And this is another, another one of the categories of experiments where something that we have not tried before. I want you to hold. Can you hold these and I will pour the water? Yeah. Not that I don't trust you to pour the water, but. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm already scared. <laughs> I pour carpet in here. So it's a share of spills. I'm holding these. You're holding oh, those. Gotcha. And they need to be held at a little bit of an angle. So that they'll pour out. So that, yep. And our, our goal is to, to track soil runoff and see what the soil runoff is. So these cups are about the same degree full. And I'm going to just start slowly pouring back here. Uh -oh. Whoops. There we go. I'm going to pour all this water in and saturate the soil. And then we're going to look at what the runoff does. And in, in real life, out in the field, if you have soil that is bare, you're going to have incredible erosion. And you're going to lose a lot of soil material. You can see that the water that's coming out, I'll move my hand there, our water that's coming out is pretty brown. Because we're going to be, we're going to be losing a lot of soil. But if you have plant material on top, even if you just have leaf litter on top, then it should be a lot better than this. So now here's the moment of truth in the category dump, dump, of dump, dump that out in the other cups. Okay. All right. Science experiments that science mom and math dad are trying live that they haven't had a chance to demo beforehand. We'll see if it works. Everybody wish us luck. I'm curious. Whoa. Sorry, math dad. It's okay. Yesterday I stepped in the water and had a wet <laughs> sock. That's better than today's. Oh man. Now, because I transplanted these little arugula seedlings from our garden and did not like plant them native in the soil, <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting about the same results. Yeah. But, well, you know, I, I wouldn't have expected different results on this one because there's always going to be some soil that's up on top that, that's loose and it's, it's going to come. But it, it would be the continued. Yes. If we continued to pour water, this one, we would wash all the water out of the bottle. Yeah. This one, the roots are going to keep it in place. Right, yeah, you're, you're going to rinse away what can rinse away that's not locked. And so, so I, I guess I didn't expect that one to work terribly well. I've seen video demonstrations where it works where it works impressively well, well, where this sort of acts as a filter and you have almost clean water coming out, and the one that's bare, you have dirty water coming out. So that's kind of what I was hoping for. But again, this was a quick run to the garden, dig up soil with plants and put it in, rather than planting my own plants. And so the root system is not quite as strong. That does, that does make sense. That does. All right. Math well, lesson time. Yeah, so, sometimes they, these things fail, and maybe more often than, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. than we would and, like. And Sarah asked, did the plants have a chance to establish themselves? I tried my very best not to disturb them when I dug them up from the garden. But you can see these ones are all flopped over still. They're like, oh my goodness, what happened to us? They, they only had 12 hours to get used to being in this container before we dumped water on them. Yeah. Yeah. In, in hindsight, I don't know. I think that one had a high probability of succeeding. But. but if you start from seed and do this one, this is a cool demo, cool demo to try. Yeah, I like that. All right. So for our math lesson, I'm going to ask you to give me some data. I'm posting a link right now where you can jump in and just fill out the form. And yeah, please just fill it out once. And while you guys are gathering me some data, and it's okay if you don't participate, I'm, it, plenty of people will will help out but i, I want to talk about finding the center of data so if, if i have some numbers i don't know uh let's do two three and seven so what's the center of that list of numbers is it obvious i don't know let me, let, what, let me know in the chat what, why do you, why do you care about finding the center um, well, we, we care about finding things that are representative of a larger population. We might, sometimes we might care, I don't know, on, on average, how tall are people? Or, um, ah, what, what did most people get on this? Or, yeah, you, you, you care about the, those type of questions all the time. Almost any time you see a list of numbers that represent something, yeah. one of the obvious questions to ask is, huh, so what's the typical case? What does that look like? And so we going to talk about measures of the central tendency today and I used the word average and my guess is that that's, that's probably the first thing that comes to mind is the average it would be the center so let, let's just think about this averages so so how many times does math dad sing that annoying song 
on average, I would on say average. at least once. But there have been a couple episodes where you did it like three or four times. And what's what song are you talking about? <laughs> I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. That wasn't supposed I'm to be singing an invitation. it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. All right, so two, three, and seven. So how does an average work? Well, with an average, another color. All our markers are missing. Okay. Oh, no. Or I've got permanent markers. I'm, I keep almost reaching for them and like, ah, not on my board. All right, so how, how, does, how does it work when we do an average? Well, basically, we just say, well, there's three things. Let's throw them all in a pool, and then we'll divide them out equally. So I could maybe steal that one, that one, and that one, and I would move them down here. And once we have those three moved down here, we see that the average height of my pile would be four. So in some sense, the the center of these is four. Here, here's another way that we could think about averages. So we've got two, three, four, five, six, seven. So those are on our number line. So if I put a weight here, a weight here, and a weight here, we could ask, if so this was just a board, where is the balance point? Where Ooh. would we actually pick the point so that this thing balances? I we've got two weights here, and only but one weight over there. I've never heard that analogy before, but I really like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it turns out, yeah, that balance point is the average. That, that's where things will balance. So how do we calculate the average? Well, we add up all the numbers and then divide by the number of values. So we would do 2 plus 3 plus 7, all divided by the number of values. So 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 7 is 12, divided by 3. And that works out to be four. So the, the first way to measure the center is to find the average. And statisticians have a different name for average. Instead of calling it the average, they call it the mean. That's kind of mean of them. It's... <laughs> yeah, why do we need two names for the same thing? I actually don't know the answer to this. What, what, what do we call it the mean? What, what, where does that terminology come from? But it really just means average. In every context I've ever found how they just mean the exact same thing. Um, could also, in some probability context, you can call it an expected value, but yeah, it just means the, the mean or the average. All right, so that was one way of finding the center of my numbers, two, three, and seven. All right, what would be another way? Well, I guess one obvious way to think about it would be, let's just find what number's in the middle. And when I say the middle, I'm talking about once we've put them into order. Well. Turns out the number three is in the middle. And we have a name for the middle term. And that one is called the median. The one that falls smack dab in the middle, which works out nicely if they're an odd number of terms. But what if you have an even number and there are two things in the middle? In that case, you just take the average of the, the two middle ones. And so sometimes we the mean is the, the average is what is the best measure, and sometimes the median is a better, better measure. So let me give, give you an example. If we wanted to talk about uh, income, how much money people make, we could just sample all the population, try to figure out, all right, makes so much per year, so much per year, and we'd get a lot of numbers. You might get $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year, $60,000 a year, but then right. you get along to, over to Bill Gates and you'd get I don't know, billion dollars a year, $3 billion a year, some huge number. And unfortunately, when you take the average, of, if we had 100 people, but one of them was Bill Gates, the average would be sky it would be huge. high, yeah, so like he, hundreds of millions of dollars. And it wouldn't represent the data at all. It would no. be very skewed. So in that case, I would say that the average is a terrible measure of the center of that data. It, it, it doesn't give us a sense of what... <laughs> The, the, the typical salary would we, be. We should have calculated that beforehand because we have enough billionaires in America that I bet the average income is something ridiculous like $700,000 a year. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that it would be quite that high because yeah. there's a lot of people and they pull it down, but it's definitely going to be curious. a skewed measure. And yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't actually calculated it, but instead the median would be a much better indicator of what a typical salary would be because yeah, the, Half the salaries are below that. Half the salaries are above that. That really does seem like a more representative value. So that's an, an 
case where I'd actually care more about the median than I would the mean. Is but, it fair to say that in statistics, people usually care more about the median than the average? No, I don't, I don't know that I would call that a, so a, a you, fair observation. You want both. You need information. Yeah, for you, both. you actually do, do need both, and yeah, we'll. We might see some some other examples of why, and it turns out there's another measure of central tendency that is often the one that we care about the most. So make up a few more data points. So, like for example, in our game that we played yesterday, what we saw was so we were trying to pick the smallest positive whole number that nobody else picked, and what we saw was that there were lots of people picking ones. There were plenty of people picking twos. There were plenty of threes, and but, but then yeah, the numbers started getting fewer, fewer and fewer, and then even, there were even some gaps maybe, and yeah, so that's kind of what we would have would have expected when we played this, especially playing it for the first time. Everybody wants to pick one because they're like, ah, I'll be sneaky because then no one will choose it, but then everybody chooses it. Well, this in this scenario. One thing showed up the most, we call this the mode, and that's, so the item that gets chosen the most. What's a scenario where we would care about the mode? Well, we would care about the mode when we were asking, say, in a, an election, who gets the most votes? Ooh. Yeah. So, so sometimes the, the most frequently chosen option is the one that we care about. I don't care about the mean necessarily here. It's kind of an interesting question. What about the median? Well, that's also an interesting question. But in the end, I might care a lot more about the mode. So the mean, median, and mode. There are other measures of central tendency. Like you can do the mid-range. Just let's, let's just do halfway between the biggest number and the smallest number. And that's also kind of an interesting measure, although that one doesn't but, show up quite as often. But these three are by far the most popular, the most useful, right? So mode, what number is picked the most? Median, the number in the middle. That's right. And then average or mean. And now MathDad right. is gathering your data. Oh boy, this is gonna be fun. Oh. We have more than a hundred people who came over and clicked on the link and took that little survey. Thanks so much for helping us create some data for this, you guys. And now MathDad yeah. is pulling it into Desmos and he's gonna start doing some graphing. That's right. So, so while he's doing the graphing, I'm going to be sneaky and ask him if he knows the answer to this riddle. Oh, you've got a riddle for me. Yeah. Okay, can I'm ready. You, can you multitask math, Dad? Can you? I can do this. <laughs> All right. I could be solid or liquid. Okay. That, um, I can be. Your ice. Nope. I can be slippery when wet. Slippery when wet. It's ice. I'm great with germs. Whoa, great with germs. I belong by the sink. Ice has lots of germs, but doesn't I, go in the sink. Ice has lots of germs. What are you talking about? <laughs> Lots of germs. All right. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, <laughs> are, are you sharing the screen or can they, can you still? Let, let, let me check, actually. Is the screen successful? No. It, it is. It's... There we go. There we go. All right. Help him out in the chat. Scroll down on the yeah, chat. Yeah. Okay. I need. I need... Sharon's got ice. it. So, Jennifer's got it. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I knew it was yep. soap all along. I, I see soap. Is even the best answer of all. Let's just combine our answers because <laughs> <laughs> icy soap is not a thing. What? <laughs> yep, I could be solid or liquid, slippery and wet, great with germs, belong by the sink. The answer is soap. <laughs> all right. So what I've got here in, in Desmos, I'm a little more familiar with Desmos than a spreadsheet. So I'm I have three columns: x1, y1, z1. I'm just going to do a histogram of x1. And X1 was, what number do you think is going to be the no, smallest? It was, X, it was X2, it wasn't X1. We'll pick. That, that's right. So we had this question, well, what's the smallest number that no one else will choose? And I've, so Ooh. you can't enter any more data at this point. All right, so here is what the histogram looks like. This is interesting. So a lot of people, quite a few people picked one, but then we had a bit of a curve. In, indeed. So when I look at this, what are we seeing here? Only, oh. only one person picked. That's four, right? Yeah. No, no, we'll say it. So Sorry, zero, sorry. zero is the one with the lot. This out here, yeah. So, <gasps> well, zero. Wait, one, a lot two, of people three. picked zero. You weren't supposed yeah. to pick zero. It was supposed to be a positive number. You, I didn't you, hear. you said zero at the beginning. I, I asked thought. for a positive number, though. Okay, <laughs> I said it had to be between zero, zero. and two. Between, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Okay, no, zero didn't win. Um, what what I see here winning Good. is. Three, right? Because uh, three has three. 
Oh, there's yeah, only there's one only person one who three. picked three. Oh my goodness, so awesome. three one in this yesterday. I know there were there were more data points, but it was twenty. That yeah, won. yesterday twenty one. And to today, three is the smallest number. But then there's also only one five, one six, and one seven. Yeah. And then we don't get another one that only has one debt get one guess until thirty nine. Yeah. So interestingly enough, twenty had the most votes. And why do you think that is? Because that was yesterday. Because it won yesterday, and that made a lot of people guess. Oh, it'll probably be around twenty. I see a lot of people picked 18, 19, 20, 21. So that's really interesting. Okay. So. But nobody guessed 16. We have a gap there. Yeah, that's, that's true. Nobody guessed 16. That's the smallest number that, that nobody picked at all. Okay. So can we look at that and actually get an estimate of the mean? Well, for the mean, if you thought about it as like a balance point, where would you pick that balance point to be? It would need to be pretty close to 50, like, or maybe even down like, yeah. could, because most of the weight's going to be in that curve. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I was going to guess, yeah, 40-ish. But yeah, let's actually compute this. So I'm just going to type mean of X2, 47.09. Good guess, math dad. You should be a mathematician. <laughs> I should. All right. Well, what about the median? What about the central value of all those? That one's a little less obvious, but because it was this one skewed to the right like that, I, my, my guess is the, the middle value was lower. So I'm going to guess that it was probably yeah, mid 30s. Oops. Median. I'm going to guess it's 35. Of X2. 23, even lower. Oh. Yeah. So we, a lot of observations early on, and then just a few people picked the bigger numbers. So and then the mode is going to be 20 because that's the one that's the highest. That's correct. The mode is 20. And I don't nice. even have a button to do that, but all right. So that, that was a cool data set. We're going to switch this over and we're going to look at the second question. So what was the second question? I wanted to know, uh oh, it was Y2, I think we called it. Aha. So this time I asked you to pick a number from, well, I guess zero to 20. And that number was supposed to be Gonna while you explain it, let's stop sharing for just a second. Okay, yeah. Do you want to pick the smallest number. Oh no, no. It was well. What's the number that most people will choose Between if we pick zero, zero to 20. twenty? Well, of course, everybody can pick any number they want. So you're just speculating here. And yeah, let, let us see what we came up with. Got to share the screen again. Go. Okay, all right. Wow, it turned out. Most people picked one, and you were right. Yeah. Ah, okay. How did you guys communicate that to each other somehow? Like the vast majority of you picked one. That's pretty cool. I don't. I wouldn't have predicted that. I would have guessed the numbers would have been all over the place because you guys can't collaborate. Uh, well, I guess you could in the chat. Maybe you were sneaking it around, but <laughs> I don't think so. No, I, I, I find that fascinating. Uh, I, I think it makes sense. I mean, you, you think, what are other people going to pick? And you'll say, other people are risk takers. They're going to guess one, thinking that no one else will pick one. I, no, they were supposed to be picking the same one, though. In this time, I asked them, yeah, what, what number will the most people choose from zero to 20? So I, independent uh, gotcha. of the game we were playing before, I would have guessed 10. Maybe people would say, oh, let's pick the middle number. But, uh, huh. Okay, so just eyeballing this, what do I expect the mean to be? Well, it's really heavy to the left, so I'm going to pick the mean. Boy, it's probably going to be something like 4-ish, 5.3. Right, and then the median will be 2. So the middle number was 2. Half the data points came before 2, half the data points came after 2. Oh, fascinating. All right, and then... Let me just peek. My third question was, oh, which whole number between 0 and 20 is the most unlucky number? Okay, Ooh. so will this be randomly distributed? This time, I don't expect it to be randomly distributed. Okay, I, I think 4 or 13 are going to be four? much higher. Because so in, in, in Chinese, the number 4 sounds like the word for death. So it's considered an unlucky number. Like I mean, in oh. China, hotels will skip the floor level 4. <laughs> and then um, in... European tradition, it, we have 13. And I'm not sure why 13 is considered unlucky, but there often is no 13th floor in a building. They just skip that number uh -huh. because it's considered unlucky. So Science Mom is correct. 13 was definitely viewed by most people as the most unlucky number. Like 44 people, it looks like, th thought the same thing. Although I'm seeing plenty of other choices. No number escaped. 
the unluckiness, a lot of people said number one. Now that I wouldn't have predicted. What's no. the most un and it's possible you were thinking about it in the context of the game we were playing. But um, yeah, just fascinating to see those numbers showing up. So in this case, what is the mean? My guess is if the balance points further to the right, probably 12-ish. Yeah, so let, let, let's see. If we calculate the mean, oops, Z2 is, oh. 10. What? So it's really almost dead center. Yeah, okay. Ah, that's good. This spike here is way, good. and it's way off to the left. So, yeah. okay. Uh, I'll buy that. So, sounds plausible. All right. And then for the median, the middle value actually is at 13. Half the data points are 13 or more, and half the data points are 13 or less. That is pretty cool. Yeah. And of course, the, the mode in that case was 13. Nice. So that, those are some ways that you can measure the center of data. And you notice how that histogram came in handy but just by being able to visualize what the data looked like. That's why we wanted to talk about histograms before we got into talking about means, medians, and modes. So thank you for those of you who contributed some data to our conversation. Yeah. Now, Math Dad, you're a numbers guy, and I saw a great question here. Jessica says, 13 is the day I was born. Does that mean I'm unlucky? What do you think, Math Dad? Are there, is there such a thing as unlucky numbers? Uh, no, lucky number 13. It's... They don't want you to know about how lucky it is, so they can't, they say it's unlucky, but it's a trick. No, <laughs> no there, there's no such thing as an unlucky number, although certainly coincidences do happen, and it's it's easy to associate luck with one number or another. And you know, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong, and you know, about half the time you're you're wrong. <laughs> but it's easy to notice things that match up with our preconceived notions, and then to just dismiss things that don't. So we have cognitive biases that, that play into that. But I, I think 13 is a pretty lucky number, a real fun number. All right. While, while we're here, let me just quickly talk about the math mystery. So last time, our math mystery involved a shape. So we, we did a square, which we then subdivided to another square, another square, another square. And then th this process just kept going forever and ever. And then we shaded in all the triangles that were pointed north, south, east, west. And that pattern went forever and ever. And the question was, what portion of this overall figure is shaded? And it worked out to be exactly one third. So the, the answer is one third is shaded. So how do I know that one third is shaded? Well, the trick is only look at that outside ring. So if you only look at that outside ring, I can subdivide it into triangles. And, oh man, I didn't draw those very straight, did I? I'm going to interrupt you real fast, Matt. Dad, several people want to know who picked three. And CJ was the first person who picked three. But there were a couple other threes that came in after that. But that was the one with the earliest time, time stamp. So when we pulled the data, CJ was the only the only three. Good job, CJ. You won yeah. against 161 people. So well, well done there. All right, yeah. So if you now look at this, you've got a bunch of triangles around this outside. There are 12 of them, but only four of them are shaded. So four out of 12 got shaded here. But then for the next ring, four out of 12 will get shaded. And then for the next ring, four out of 12 will get shaded. And what you'll see is it's always one third of each of these square rings are getting shaded. Ooh. So overall, one third of the entire figure is shaded. I like how you sort of broke that down into a different problem. Like I almost feel like you you changed you changed the parameters so then it's something that you can solve. That, that, that's right. And we could use our geometric series formula, but given our lack of time, I'm not going to. All right, so what is our challenge for tomorrow? Reminder here. Oh, oh, it's oh. It's the chicken and egg okay. question. Okay, yeah, this is a chicken and an egg problem, although a different one than you're probably thinking of. So here's what the problem is. A chicken and a half can lay an egg and a half in a day and a half. How many eggs can one chicken lay in one day? And if you're thinking, wait, wait, I didn't have a chance to write that down, um, on patreon.com slash science mom, this is a free printout that you can download and view, and the math mystery is written right there. That's right. So one more time. A chicken and a half can lay an egg and a half in a day and a half. How many eggs can one chicken lay in one day? So don't don't try to look up the answer. See if you can think through it on your own. See if you can get it on your own. Awesome. I'm going to move our view back this way real quick, and we'll take just a couple questions before we do our art show. Oh, engineering challenge. Oh, the <laughs> engineering challenge. 
The engineering challenge is to build a Newton's cradle. These are a popular little desktop toy that you've probably seen before. And if you have them level, which is gonna be tricky with how much stuff we have on our little desk here, wait for them to stop moving. And you'll, you'll notice I don't have, like, this one seems like it's a little higher and unfortunately. Yeah, ours, ours, the duct tape shifted a little bit. They're not lined up quite as yeah, well as Yeah, I thought I had it better than this, but. But it still, it still works. We pull this back. Kind of worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of that got, got transferred. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Did yeah. you see how this second one moved out? Yeah, or if I do two at a time, did that, then you get, did that knock two of them? It did. It did. Okay. They're, they're a lot of fun to play with. And if you have time to do a little more precision than we did here, make sure they're lined up straight, then uh, you see some pretty cool things. I'll, I'll warn we, you, though, don't, don't do it like um, in the image here. Oh, did you delete it? Where, where was the image? Right there. Right there. Oh, it's right there. You do need to have two strings coming down. So this is like our, our drawing is just very simplified, but you need to have two strings coming down. If you just have one string coming down, then when they, they collide, flop side to side, yeah. Yeah, then they'll just kind of go everywhere. But I want to show them what we did with water balloons. Oh, yeah. Because this was, so this this was pretty fun. All right. Share screen, tab, video. video. Yep. All right. So we tried to build one of these using water balloons. And unfortunately, yeah, we had some side to side action. We, we, we needed it. To, it wasn't quite as, as we, dramatic as we were hoping, but it's still fun to see. Yeah, so we, here we, we go. To stabilize it a little better. Here comes the balloon in slow motion. Boom! Ooh. And it makes the other one go, go flying, which is quite fun to see. And if you did them with really large water balloons that were tighter, could it be enough force that one of them could break? That's kind of what we were, what we were experimenting with, what we thought might be fun to try. None of ours broke, but there are just a couple ideas for you if you want to run with that and have some fun with a Newton's Cradle. There are a few variations you can do. And now we'll take just a couple questions and then we will do our art showcase. I did see someone asking about chia seeds and if the chia seeds can, can mold. And if you keep them too wet, any seeds can mold if they are too wet for too long, but the chia seeds don't mold very easily. If you start to see some tiny little white hairs on them, usually that's roots getting ready to come out and the roots will come out and they'll start growing before they mold. So you don't need to worry about that too much. I saw the question, do you need a Patreon account to download the worksheets? No, no, you yeah. don't. So when you go to the Patreon post and pull it up at the bottom of the post, there will be a little blue letter link. And if you just click on that, the PDF, you'll automatically be able to download the PDF. If you want to get a notification, each time I make a Patreon post and the notes and the link for tomorrow's um, episode are posted, if you want to be like the first to know, then you need to make it a Patreon account, but you can gotcha. follow the page and that's completely free. And then you'll just get an email each time we post. And if you want to contribute, um, we produce about 30 episodes a month-ish. So $5, if, you play, if you're able to support it, $5 a month, I mean, that's just 20 cents per episode of Quarantine to support this so that other people are able to appreciate it for free. Cause that's our goal. We want, we want to deliver this for free. All right. to as many people as we can. Okay, let's look at art. Um, All right, art showcase. The art showcase today we're quite excited about because there were so many really fun, really fun perspectives here. Yeah, perspective. And again, um, check out check out the Facebook page because there are even more. <laughs> and we'll, I think we're, are we down at the bottom? Oh, we're not, we started in the middle of we our slideshow. We started in the middle, fake out. All right, now we're ready. <laughs> so we've got <laughs> kids in a ladle, and then mm, this is delicious. look at look at this wonderful ballerina costume. Like it looks like looks like a All dress flowery, yes, out of indeed. carnations. <gasps> Someone's about to get stepped on. Look out! Look out! Oh no! And we've got a dinosaur that's about to eat a eat a kid, <laughs> and then poor Sophia is shrunk and can't get her lunch. <laughs> I love it. We've got Madison. Ooh, giant phone. Giant phone. Our kids would like that. <laughs> Tyrannosaurus Rex is about to get someone, and look at that giant ball. It's like, no, not the tennis ball of doom. Wilson. Ah, trying to push a push shoe. Push that shoe. Huge. Push harder. You got this. You got this. And I, th I think the lighting worked out especially well here because you can't quite tell that the focus is different. Yeah. And that's really the trick is getting the focus to kind of have both things in focus. Standing on top of a Gatorade bottle. Standing on top of a Rubik's Cube. Yeah, let's make those things stronger than I yeah. used to when I was a kid. <laughs> About to get trapped in a cup. Oh, no! captured. <laughs> another, oh. another shoe one. Look out. 
giants are roaming the land. And then holding a giant daffodil. And I thought, I mean, really careful placement there with the hands. These are, and I bet you guys know after trying to do some of these. Blocking these are, the face too. That, that's that's yeah. clever. <laughs> these are a little trickier to do than you would think. A kid's sandwich. Mm. <laughs> Nicely done. And then we've got a skateboard trick about over. To smash somebody here. Yeah. I'm really and impressed with this one. The Hulk is tearing someone in half. Ah! <laughs> this one I'm so impressed with. And I'm curious if they use some Photoshop because. I, like, I don't see a support for their hands, and I don't think it would be possible. So, I'm Maybe I'm not they, sure they, how they're they took a hundred different photos and finally got one that worked. I, I don't know, but that's... I don't know, but way impressed, way impressed with the Hulk, the Hulk one. And then we've got magnifying, magnifying glass, glass, looking at a tiny little person. <laughs> Isn't that great? I feel so bad. And now hexaflexagons, and I'm so happy that you guys were able to make these. These are so fun. Oh yeah, really cool patterns you came up with. Yeah, Shab, yes. great work. And that is that is it. Anything else you want to say? Closing math, Dad. Yeah. Um. No, just really, way cool. I'm so glad you guys had had fun with that a prompt. You came up with several ideas that hadn't even occurred to me, and and you actually pulled them off. And this is just the ones that didn't have identifiable faces that we were able to. There pull are a together. lot more in our Facebook page that yeah. If you go to go to that album and look at, it's so fun to see the creativity, and you might get some just fun ideas of other other pictures you can try. Yeah. So if, if you're looking for for ways to contribute to the community, and just going in and looking at the images, replying to them, liking the ones that you like on either uh, Instagram or Facebook, that's a great way to contribute and, and be a part of this. So thank you very much for those of you who are taking the time to get contribute and yep. share your work. And we will um, we will be back tomorrow with more geology. We are going to talk about weathering and erosion tomorrow. And we have a lot of really fun. I have to say, like for me, the science part, I sort of felt like today ecology is so awesome, but I didn't have time to like set up cool demos. And it's a harder one to do demonstrations for. But tomorrow we've got some really fun erosion activities. And then on Friday, we have the interview with the volcanologist. And on Saturday, um, Math Dad and I have a patron only live stream about luck that we'll be doing. And then, of course, we'll be back next week with more content and we'll be here until the end of May. So thank you so much for making this possible because it's because of you guys, our viewers and our patrons, that we're able to continue doing this. And we're having a blast. Indeed we are. So thanks. Be safe and have fun. Bye.